Good afternoon. Welcome to Midcap Radar. I'm Sonal Bhutra. With me, as always, is Vivek Kaiyar. What a fall today in the markets. At the day's low, there was a possibility of some recovery, but that has been sold into as well across the board. It's a sea of red. That's right. You know, it's actually going ahead and repeating the story that we saw yesterday. Good overnight queues, a gap of open, but then significant sell-off as far as the market is concerned. Action pack show, quite a few management. Okay. So let's start off with All time. right. Okay, Vivek, we'll do one thing. We'll uh, discuss that and a lot more. But first up, let's start the show with the top headlines. Key indices are days low as the fall intensifies. Losers far outnumber gainers after the earnings season fails to provide any fresh cues for broad optimism on growth. All sectors come under pressure with FMCG being the big outlier. Mid-cap index falls over 2.5%. SRF under pressure amid broader market sell-off and ahead of its quarter 4 numbers, sequential recovery to be seen due to deferment of orders to quarter 4. However, commentary from Pure on price realisation of a key product are declining also worries investors. CG Power gains after their quarter 4 revenue beats street estimates. Power system segment outperforms while industrial segment witnesses modest growth. Management tells CNBC TV18 that they expect top-line growth of 20-25% to in FY25. T-Tagger Rail gains as Morgan Stanley initiates coverage on the stock with an overweight call and a target price of 1,285 rupees a share, forecasting a strong 28% earnings CAGR from FY24 to FY27. Marico is up over 8% in trade after the company guides for double-digit revenue growth in FY25. The company also expects the operating margin to inch up over the next few years. Godrich Consumer gains on the back of a good fourth quarter. Management tells CNBC TV18 that the company will sustain high single-digit volume growth and improve margins in their overseas geographies. Okay, all right, those are the top headlines. Let's quickly take a look at the markets as well. The Nifty is down 157 points. The mid-cap index uh, at the day's low as well, 1,030 points shaved off there. Again, we are seeing some recovery, but that's really very minute right now. The bank Nifty is also down 1%, but the biggest fall is seen in the mid-caps and the small caps. And the advanced decline ratio in the favor of declines by a huge margin. You are absolutely right. Uh, in fact, you know, since Friday, Friday is when you know you started seeing the selling pressure emerge. And since Friday, uh, mid-cap index, you know, as of just around 15-20 uh, minutes back, had shaved off almost 1,300 points in just the last three trading sessions. When you're talking about the small cap index, last three trading sessions down over 640 points. And when you're talking about the Nifty 500 index, it's down over 450 points as far as the last three trading sessions are concerned. Now, when you're talking about, you know, these three indices, you know, they are the best barometer. When it comes to the broader end of the markets, that's why we're talking about it right now. Okay, let's move on and talk about Happiest Mind Technologies. The stock is in focus on the back of its earnings. Uh, in fact, my colleague Reema Tendulkar caught up with the management. Let's listen in to that conversation. A quick uh, recap of what we have done through the year. 18% uh, growth in total income. Uh, about 14% in rupee terms uh, on operating revenues and 11% growth in EBITDA. We have beaten our EBITDA guidance for the 16th quarter in a row. So if you look at it, compared to what the markets have been um, declaring, we have done a reasonable set of numbers. And in constant currency, we have grown at 11%, very close to the 12% guidance that we gave. So it's quite encouraging what we have to show as a performance for the previous year. Looking ahead, uh, like you said, there are two acquisitions that we have done, Macmillan Learning and Pure Software. Macmillan Learning is a smaller one, which, is, which will quickly get integrated. And Pure Software will be, you know, there has to be a planned process to get that into our, uh, into our story very quickly. While, like I said earlier, it's synergistic, it's uh, EPS accretive, it's cash accretive, and it is business accretive. So it's accretive in all terms. So we are looking to integrate it very well into our business in the next uh, one to two years and then see how one plus one can be 2.5 or three. As far as an estimate for the next year, I would uh, hold back from using the word guidance because, you know, there are a few mu uh, moving parts here. The estimate of growth for the next year, we, would, uh, we are looking at 35 to 40% on revenues. This, this considers both organic and inorganic and a decent, uh, very good organic growth as well. So it's not all coming from the inorganic uh, acquisitions that we have done. And as far as margins are concerned, we we would like to you know uh, have a broad range of 20% to 24% and then uh, like to uh, position EBITDA and operating margin going forward. 
Um, why I say that is EBITDA has a component of other income. And as you deploy cash into acquisitions, you have to see uh, that becomes part of the business growth and business profitability, and uh, you need to balance both of them. So that's why I'm giving a uh, you know larger uh, spectrum of 20 to 24 percent on margins. And as we have done, uh, the idea is to meet and possibly beat those numbers. Uh, Joseph, you want to elaborate? Uh, Venkat said that there are a lot of moving parts, which is why he's not using the word guidance. He's using the word estimate. Uh, what are the headwinds? What are the tailwinds? How is the market environment currently? And can you at least tell us if the organic growth in FI25 will be better than the FI24 organic growth without getting into numbers? Uh, so if you just look at the uh, the market, uh, uh, the uh, and I break it up into three, four different areas. If you look at from a geo perspective, I think clearly one of the uh, the things that's coming across clearly is that uh, India as a uh, as a market and as a source of business is really uh, looking very promising. There's a fair bit of investment that's uh, being made. The economy, as you uh, know, is doing quite well, uh, especially relatively speaking. So, and if you look at our performance also, the percentage of revenues from India has increased almost 3% on a year-on-year -year basis, and quarterly it's been increasing. So we will continue focusing on this market uh, while balancing out margin considerations. So that's from a... Uh, geo perspective, if you look at it from a uh, vertical uh, different uh, segments, uh, there are a few segments that look uh, like they are sustaining their spend or even you know doing quite well. Healthcare clearly is an area that is, uh, uh, and again it's borne out by the, our numbers, is an area that's seeing continued uh, spend, especially on the uh, the digital side of pharma, some of the medtech uh, companies. They continue to make investments, and that's an area that we are focused on. In edutech, we're looking more at K-12 now uh, because higher ed is still impacted. That's a headwind, I would say. But the tailwind in this segment would be on the K-12 side. Uh, and uh, I would say high tech continues to remain the same. Uh, there's not much movement. It's still cautious. Uh, if you look at retail CPG, the CPG part, there's a lot of investment going on in how to engage with uh, end uh, users, how to uh, use technology to, 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 to collaborate, to build networks, and uh, use data and analytics more in decision uh, making. Industrial manufacturing continue to see spends on modernization. So that's what I would call out. BFSI is still being a little cautious. Uh, so that's from a uh, vertical perspective. And the last point I wanted to make, uh, second last point actually, because the last one I want to reserve for Gen AI. The second last point I wanted to make is if you look at the way customers are approaching their spend, uh, there is a bit of caution in how they are deploying their uh, dollars and their budget. Uh, there seems to be more openness to getting into some of the road mapping and discovery uh, uh, consulting exercises. But once that's done, uh, getting into implementation is taking a little longer, which is where you're seeing deal cycles getting elongated. The last point I wanted to make is on Jenny. I think there we are seeing a lot of excitement from customers. Uh, there's a propensity to uh, to uh, to experiment, to look at use cases. And I put them into three buckets. One is customers who have an, you know a, a, a strategy in place and they are trying to implement that. Uh, second is customers who want to do something and have, you know, are, are exploring POCs and use cases. And the third is customers who want to do something, but they don't have an idea what to do, right? And our offerings the, and our approach is, uh, is, is catered towards these three segments, whether it's horizontal or vertical use cases. And we are seeing quite a lot of traction, 14 customers already, uh, that, and, and many more uh, where we're having discussions and uh, prospects. Okay. Uh, and uh, just one final question then on the organic growth in FI25. Can it be better than FI24? So, uh, you know, I, I would say given, I, I, I would say given our pipeline and uh, the, the, uh, the uh, pipe, uh, the market conditions and some of the segments that we are focused on, our goal would be to, 
to 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 do something uh, similar if not better just like venkat mentioned on margin front as well you know we've given our uh, range and we've always try to do better than you know the the uh, goals that we've set for ourselves so that that would be the uh, aim and uh, goal uh, reema well a very interesting conversation with the management of happiest minds let's talk up 3% uh, in the session today but let's now slip into a short break we'll get you more on the markets and stock specific action on the other side Welcome back to Midcap Radar. Let's now shift our attention to Aeroflex Industries. The stock slumps on the back of its Q4 numbers, EBITDA margin contracts, and the net profit also declines on a year-on-year -year basis, while the revenue grew 11%. Asad Dow, the managing director of the company, joins us now. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Mr. Dow, the you know, first thing we want to ask you is that uh, what was the reason for the fall as far as the calculated EBITDA margins was concerned? Um, uh, was there significant input pricing pressure? so if you look at our uh, our margins for the entire year right so they have grown by about uh, 24% in terms of our uh, ebitda margins and our pat margins have grown by almost 40% uh, if you consider fy23 to fy24 now uh, in in q4 of fy23 we had a specific uh, project or uh, order which was a very large order and which had really good margins and hence the reason for uh, you know if you see that the decline in the q4 margins uh, you know for this uh, for fy24 also uh, another reason is because of the red sea crisis right uh, there has been a significant increase in uh, the cost of the ocean freights uh, that has also resulted in a slightly lower uh, you know ebitda margin but if okay. you see from a year on year basis i think uh, we have grown No, so even on an FY24 basis, the calculated margin show it is at 19.4%, which is a decline of 20 basis points. And quarter four basis, it is a decline of 800 basis points that we have seen in your margins. Yeah, so uh, the margins in the last uh, uh, you know quarter specifically were uh, slightly lo lower, uh, you know, because of this issue of the ocean freight. We are uh, uh, already working on this, and in this year, we definitely expect our margins overall. to be uh, you know about 20% for the entire year and uh, we expect also our our rebit the growth uh, in the next year to be about 25% uh, and upwards so you've given a range of uh, ebitda growth for the next year you've also given a revenue target so are you on track to meet that uh, the second question you know what we want to ask you is that a significant portion uh, does come in from exports so what's been the hit over there given all the disruptions there and fy25 how will the revenue mix look like so uh, in fy24 uh, about 84% of our sales is from exports uh, and in fy25 you'll see uh, a similar ratio of domestic sales to export sales export will continue to be our major uh, focus uh, uh, in the next few years um, in terms of the uh, the growth that we are uh, expecting uh, yes yeah, so uh, uh, even in terms of ebitda and in terms of revenue we are de definitely expecting much better growth uh, in in the current financial year which is fy25 as compared to uh, fy24 expecting good growth in fy25 how much of it will be coming in from the new capacity expansion that uh, the company is undertaking you had indicated that you expect revenues to grow by 20 to 25% per annum for the next 4 years um, how much of it will be contributed from the new capacities and uh, which will grow faster the export market or the dom domestic market for you so in terms of uh, you know purely percentage wise the growth so definitely domestic market might grow at a higher percentage wise but obviously the share of the domestic market uh, uh, you know is very less as compared to the export so the overall uh, the growth in terms of value terms will come uh, more uh, from uh, the exports uh, in terms of 
our uh, uh, our overall you know capacity utilization so right now we are at about uh, 87 to 88% utilization and uh, the growth in the upcoming f5 will be one from obviously the capacity that we have recently expanded and and what we are planning to do in f5 25 and also with our focus on selling higher value added products which will help not only on the top line but will also help us to increase the bottom line at a faster pace okay uh, now give us a sense of revenue visibility so where does your current order book stand at at the end of fi24 also give us a sense of which are the you know how's the order inflow looking like and uh, fi25 where do you expect to end the order book at so in generally in our case so we have uh, a mix of customers some customers they gave us a yearly planning and then they release the orders on on a per a quarter basis and some customers generally you know give us an order for every quarter so generally we have a visibility for the entire year but in terms of the pure order book that ranges between the 2 to 3 months okay uh, can you give us a sense of uh, the inorganic opportunities that you are looking for there is an indication that you are is it a particular segment is it uh, in the domestic markets or the export markets and what is the kitty that you have set aside will it happen in this calendar year so one of the inorganic acquisition we have already completed and announced uh, in the first week of april we acquired a company called uh, hide air uh, engineering private limited they are into manufacturing of uh, fittings and components so uh, the acquisition of this company will help us to uh, to, to better penetrate the market of assemblies uh, so right now we are uh, buying the uh, fittings from from outside so uh with the help of this acquisition we will be uh, shifting some of our purchases of uh, fittings to in house plus also uh, uh hide air has its market presence in railways in ship building and in heavy industries where aeroflex is right now not present so that will also help us to expand our domestic market as well and that acquisition we have already you know completed okay and any are there in the pipeline in terms of acquisitions or are you evaluating any target companies Yes, so we are uh, also evaluating a few more companies. Obviously, they are at a very early stage of discussion. Uh, you know, uh, once anything is finalized, uh, you, you know, we'll what will be the price. size and the top line? Uh, you know, what kind of top line would you expect to add from these companies, and what is the kind of amount you are willing to spend to acquire them? So uh, we uh, we currently have about seventy six crores of uh, you know cash and bank uh, you know balance with us. Uh, Uh, you, you know which we raised from the ipo proceeds so uh, we have sufficient capital for uh, any strategic uh, acquisition so for us it's it's uh, not only about the size of the acquisition but also how it uh, it fits in uh, to the product portfolio of aeroflex so obviously i will not be able to comment on the size but it has to fit uh, strategically to the overall uh, product flow of aeroflex and uh, and we are also open to looking at acquisitions both in india and in the overseas market right we get that can you give us a sense of the capex that you have planned for fi25 and fi26 as i said a lot of capacities are coming in what would that do to the capex number and will this lead to addition of debt in your books so uh, right now we are uh, debt free and we uh, we want to remain uh, debt free at, at least for the foreseeable future or uh, you know future so uh, any uh, uh, any capex the which we are planning to do in in this uh, current financial year and obviously in the next financial year it will be uh, it will be purely funded from the uh, ipo proceeds and from the internal accruals so uh, in the next couple of years we are looking at an uh, at an overall capex of about 100 crores okay all right thank you so much asad for joining us today and giving us all those details that's the word coming in from aeroflex industries uh the margins did decline this time around and that's been uh the disappointment the stock is down 4% but the management is confident they will be able to recover it in fy25 we'll slip into a short break when we come back we'll talk more about the markets and stock specific action because there's a lot happening out there stay tuned
Welcome back to Midcap Radar, Rob. Well, the market, at least for the time being, seems to have arrested its fall to a little bit. As you can see, the Nifty has bounced back marginally uh, from 1 p.m. onwards. A uh, couple of interesting stocks on the radar. You know, first up, have a look at the entire metal pack. The metal pack today is seeing quite a bit of a sell-off. Now, despite positive news flow, have a look at Hindalco. Hindalco amongst the ones that is taking quite a bit of selling pressure. Have a look at all of the ferris names. So look at Sale, look at Tata Steel, look at JSPL, even you know JSW Steel. All of these stocks also continue to remain under pressure. The chemical pack, you know, one particular stock that has taken it on the chin today is actually SRF. There has, you know, results are expected today, but there has been some negative commentary coming through and a negative read through that has come through, you know, from the conference call of Gujarat Florochem. And this is something that the market has not taken too kindly to. The stock is down almost six and a half percent as we speak. Uh, on the other hand, what continues to be the shining light is the FMCG names. So, you know, have, we can again do a check as far as Dabur is concerned, GCPL, have a look at names like Marico, you know, multiple upgrades coming in over there. And on the back of that, that particular space, that particular sector doing quite well. Along with that, you know, this particular trend has gone ahead and also aided the consumer discretionary names. So if you have a look at names like uh, uh, Jubilant Foodworks, Westlife Developers, all of these names do doing quite well in the session today. But that's all the time we have on this edition of Midcap Radar, Mutual Fund Corner, when we return.